Mr. <laughs> again, we want you to do that. Shut your cell phones down. I'd like to introduce you to the president of the Southside Development Association, Laura Jeff Freese. Freese. Please, Jeffrey, thank you. There's only one of you. One of <laughs> I wanted to say thank you to all of you today for coming out. We sincerely really appreciate your time. Uh, hopefully, we have some great information for you today that um, will help you learn a little more about the plan, Cheyenne, and, and help you to make an informed decision on how you feel about it and that type of thing. So today, the first thing I'd like to do is ask you to please stand and let's say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to, uh, we have uh, two elected officials with us today. We have uh, Commissioner Emily Hayes-Gower, um, who just spoke, and we also have our wonderful Mayor Rick Hayson as well. So thank you, gentlemen. Woo. Cheyenne 
would then either, they would act upon Plan Cheyenne. That could be approval, it could be rejection, or it could even possibly be postponed for future uh, for review. Depends on what the uh, final decision is by the governing body. So hope, hopefully those dates and times are somewhat helpful. Thank you, we appreciate uh, the information. Oh, if I may also, that would be, uh, at least from the city standpoint, and I trust the same thing from the county, Media releases, notifications, reminders of those times. Uh, it'll be on uh, the City of Cheyenne's website, too, as a reminder of those dates. Thank you, sir. We sincerely appreciate that information. All right, without further ado, we do have the speech of the It's great to see you all here. Um, have we already recognized the elected officials besides yes. the mayor? Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry I missed that first part. Um, if you were here last time, we're just going to go over a couple of the basic ways we're going to do this afternoon. Um, I would like anyone who is here who is planning to run for office to also be recognized. Is there anyone here today who is planning? Yes, can you stand up, sir? I'm Mike Cutt, and I'm running for uh, county sheriff. And he's running on a an oathkeeper slash constitutional platform. Amen. So please stand if you have ever. Oh, excuse me, one moment. We have another uh, wonderful man who has just joined us. Can you uh, introduce yourself, sir? All right, so if you have ever taken an oath to defend the Constitution, please stand and remain standing. Test, test. There, it's it's a low battery flashing at me, so it, um, we're going to need to change it. But I'll go until we lose it again. So there are a lot of people in this room who have different political views. We are going to be open-minded and respectful of all of those differences. We are going to be very honest about what we talk. Yeah. <laughs> what we talk about today. I'll just wait. Test. That's much better. Um, so the goal for today is to offer accurate information taken directly from Plan Cheyenne. There will be a few references to Plan Fort Collins as we do this. Um, but I, over the past two weeks since our first town hall meeting on February 8th, I have had a chance to delve into specific details of these plans that um, relate specifically to Cheyenne and Laramie County. So I'm, I am an independent investigative journalist. I've been doing uh, pretty much focused research on these plans over the past six years. I'm not an attorney. I do not provide any legal advice. I do protect the environment. I am concerned about the health and well-being of people throughout the world. 
And I have ridden my bicycle and walked thousands of miles <laughs> through my lifetime because I like to do that. It's actually a choice that I make uh, anytime I can. That's how I get around. Plan Cheyenne says the goal of the plan is to bring the city's regulations into compliance with Plan Cheyenne. That's stated in the plan. So what brings Plan Cheyenne to, into compliance with the law? Does anyone have a copy of the United States Constitution with them? Excellent. Can you hold that up? This, this is relevant. There's, in the front row here, um, we have a couple constitutions. They're very small, easy to read. In about 30 minutes, you can get through it. Excellent. Look at all these constitutions here. They're, those are going to come in handy. Who has the Wyoming Constitution? The Wyoming Constitution is 77 pages long. Not, not too shabby. Do you have to be an attorney to understand the Constitution? No. If the answer is yes, how can anyone who is not an attorney swear to honor and obey the Constitution? But a lot of people want you to think that you have to be an attorney to understand what the law is. So the hierarchy, this is just a quick review as we go through this because the law is what we're talking about today and the uh, specific documents. So the people are at the top of the, the hierarchy in the United States. Then we have the United States Constitution, the Wyoming Constitution, the Wyoming statutes are underneath that. Municipal codes, rules, regulations, procedures, guidelines, and suggestions are all below that. So keep that in mind as we go through today. Does anyone disagree that the people are the, the top of this chart? Yes, sir. If the people were at the top of the two chain, then why aren't we voting on this instead of having governmental people making choices for us like we are children? That's an excellent point. So keep that in mind as we go through this today. So the people are at the top, the Constitution is next. If any or all of these documents, this is the Unified Development Code for Cheyenne and Laramie County, this is Plan Cheyenne, this is the January update. This is over 500 pages of the Plan Cheyenne update. So the Unified Development Code is around uh, 400 pages. If anything in those documents is not in compliance with the Constitution of Wyoming or the United States. What is that non-compliance called? Void. 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 What else? No. Illegal. Unlawful. 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 Dr. Haynes gets it. Unlawful. There's a difference between lawful and legal, and a lot of you know what that is already. Okay. Quick facts. This is a quick review. If you were here on the eighth, we're going to go through this real quickly. Plan Cheyenne was first adopted in 2006. This is um, in January of 2014. They did an update draft, which is more than 500 pages. They have major changes in this uh, draft update. The first seven years of Plan Cheyenne in Fort Collins was just used as a test period to see how the people of Cheyenne would react to it respect, with respect to um, documents in the, in the plan. The consulting firms report in Plan Cheyenne that there was extensive public participation. What that means is 30 committee members, which were tied to the city and the county, and then 45 people from the community participated. That's extensive. And in this room right here, I haven't counted, but I, I think we have more than 45, probably by double. Yeah. So these are the major changes in Plan Cheyenne. Land use is a big deal. So the natural tr trends that the consultants have found in Cheyenne and Laramie County is that you all prefer large lots for your homes with space between you and your neighbors. The plan's goals say that compact development patterns, patterns are in store for you. The way they're going to do that is by using infill. So any, any place there's an empty lot or an old home, that's going to be torn down and a big um, multi-unit <coughs> complex is going to be put in its place. This is an example of what infill looks like. And I have a lot of these photos printed on that table over there when you're done uh, this afternoon. Feel free to go over there and look at them up close. <coughs> This is in Fort Collins. This is infill in Fort Collins. Plan Fort Collins and Plan Cheyenne are, are done by the same consulting firms, and so they're basically identical documents being applied in different communities. Uh, another thing of infill is in your old communities in downtown Cheyenne, the, uh, the old homes, a lot of them are going to be torn down or condemned, and in its place will be, this is a single family home next to this little white house. So that's one house that is taking up an entire lot now instead of having grass and garden area. One home is now uh, basically dwarfing that little tiny white house. 
So transportation is another major update in Plan Cheyenne. Again, the consulting firm found that uh, people prefer to travel freely and at times that meet their family schedules and their work schedules. The plan's goals are to teach people how to plan their days better so that you can walk and bike instead of drive. That would sure work well today. Historically, if you planned, though, you could have left yesterday before the storm came. <laughs> <laughs> Historic preservation is another key uh, major update in Plan Cheyenne for this year. And again, the consulting firm found that natural trends of people in Cheyenne and Laramie County is that you like to um, own things, that you like to control what you own. The plan's goals is to control the property values in downtown Cheyenne and to use historic districts to raise the cost of living in those established neighborhoods. This is in Fort Collins. This private business owner, this is along State Highway 287. This private business owner wants to sell this property, but the building is more than 50 years old, and Plan Fort Collins has historic preservation just like Plan Cheyenne. The state transportation is funding part of this highway improvement, and because that money is linked to historic preservation in our plan, this um, business owner has to get a historic review done before he can list his property. This review process adds nearly a year before he can even put a for sale sign up for his business. If he gets approved to sell that property and to have uh, a new owner do whatever they would like with that property, it's going to come with a lot of restrictions because it is 50 years old, more than 50 years old. And if you look at the building, uh, it doesn't look like a building that would probably be too wise to preserve might be better sustainability-wise, environmentally, just to start over. Regionally appropriate architecture is another major update in your plan. And the question is, what if your plans don't fit what these consulting firms determine to be appropriate for Cheyenne? What do you do then? Bulldoze it. Bulldoze what? I won't ask specifically what you want to bulldoze. <laughs> So uh, who, de who decided what was appropriate for Cheyenne in this plan, Cheyenne? If you are from Cheyenne, raise your hand if you participated in determining what was appropriate regionally. That doesn't look so good. So nobody helped determine what was appropriate for your community. The mayor did. The mayor did. What is community visioning? Community visioning is what started this entire plan, Cheyenne process well before 2006. So again. Did anyone here participate in the whole plan Cheyenne creation starting decades ago? One person did. Excellent. Two people. Yes, I remember you. And yes, Ms. Grigsby there. Okay, these binders again. These are the, this is the Unified Development Code. This is Plan Cheyenne. Almost a thousand pages. Those are the, the documents that are the foundation of this plan, but there are thousands upon thousands of more pages and documents to go with it. We're gonna go through some of those. I would also like to uh, recognize another elected official who has walked in. This is uh, Councilor Williams who's with the City of Cheyenne. Thank you so much for being here today. So here's what happens with these plans. We have so many documents that most people don't have the time to read them and that leads to confusion and chaos. Most people just give up. They say there's no way I can invest the next four weeks learning about Plan Cheyenne. So they trust their elected officials to do that. And when we were at the uh, first public hearing a, a couple weeks ago, the question was asked of the panel, how many of you have actually read the document? Do you remember what the answer was? No. None. None. Zero. Nobody had read it, even though they, they voted to adopt it. That's a concern, because there's a lot in, that, in those documents that are going to impact all of you. So what do the Unified Development Codes have to do with Plan Cheyenne? Those are inseparable documents. The UDC codes are the enforcement mechanism for the plans and policies in Plan Cheyenne, and that's listed in those documents. Binding and inseparable. That means you can't do one without the other. That's why they had to update the Unified Development Codes in October of 2013, so that the um, update for Plan Cheyenne of January 2014 would be enforceable. These documents here, this is what I've been doing for the past two weeks, and it's going to take a little bit of time, but you need to understand the complexity here. All of these documents with the silver rings are studies that the city of Cheyenne has done on bicycling and walking. 
Now, if you listen to the consulting firms, you would think that there is no way that Cheyenne is planning to be like Fort Collins and have biking and walking. Stay with me here. This is a volume one of a conceptual plan for biking. This is the Cheyenne Metropolitan Pedestrian Plan. This was finished in August of 2010. This is just the pedestrian plan. This is volume one of the bicycle plan, volume two of the bicycle plan, volume three of the bicycle plan. These are all internal memorandums from a consulting firm that are directly communicating with the city of Cheyenne about how to force business owners to implement biking and walking plans. This is the best one. See all these little purple tabs? This is the, one of the main consulting firms that was used for the biking and walking plan. This man's name is Michael Ronkin. This was done on December 6th of 2010. Were you all invited to this presentation? No. For um, the bikeway design workshop? No. Raise your hand if you were aware that it was happening in December of 2010. So, this consultant is from Switzerland, and he has, has a major part in what's coming to Cheyenne. So there are about 3,000 pages here of bike and walking studies that you all have paid for. How much? We're going to find out. <laughs> so let's talk about the external consulting firms first. Michael Ronkin is from Switzerland, ABI is from Fort Collins in Cheyenne, Alta Planning is from Portland, Oregon, Urban Interactive Studio is from Denver, Economic and Planning Systems is from Oakland, LA, Sacramento, and Denver, Fair and Peers is from Colorado, Hawaii, California, Washington, and Utah, Clarion Associates, Fort Collins, Denver, Florida, Illinois, North Carolina, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. That's who's planning Cheyenne, just for your bike and walking. I didn't delve into other areas right now, we're just focusing on this one aspect. 3,000 pages, but the key documents, the links were broken for those key documents. Six key documents for biking and walking I could not access. All right, in all of the public Plan Cheyenne meetings and through all the media coverage, there's been a lot of it, right? A lot of media coverage on Plan Cheyenne? No. Did you all know about the, the massive tax money and, that you were spending for these studies? No. Thank you, Okay, so here's what's happened. I filed Wyoming Open Records Access Request with Mr. Tom Mason of the Cheyenne Metropolitan Planning Organization to obtain the contracts and agreements with those external consulting firms. Because I'm curious about how much you've paid for that and what the agreements say. Aren't you curious? Yes. That's a lot of studying. So what's the mission? The mission of Plan Cheyenne is to make Cheyenne more sustainable, to reduce carbon emissions, to make Cheyenne more livable by teaching people how to walk and bike instead of drive, to create compact housing developments, and to teach private business owners how to use government approved products and methods. Where did the foundation originate? That's from the Community Vision 2020. These are mandated policies and agreements from the European Union and other countries for the United States to reduce carbon emissions by 80% before the year 2020. That means you're going to have to at least drive 80% less, heat your home at least 80% less, or figure out how to go off the grid completely, which is kind of a cool idea. And breathe 80% less. Breathe 80% less, yes, Dr. Gaines. <laughs> you guys are so fortunate because you actually have a candidate for governor who can understand what's happening here. Plan Cheyenne mission accomplished. They use the Unified Development Codes as the enforcement mechanism. They're living documents, which means they're automatically implemented. Once they're voted by your elected officials, they're automatically implemented by your city and county staff and employees. That's one way that they bypass the elected officials. The plan says Cheyenne's unique Western heritage will be preserved. <laughs> Don't think so. Why are you laughing? We're in a building right now that is the Western Heritage Design, right? When you look outside, you think what, Old West? No. <laughs> this is the Laramie County Design Library that is supposed to be Western Heritage. Of course, you all saw that when we came in. 
This is Fort Collins Museum. Looks a lot like the library. Let's go over terminology, because one of the things that these documents do is to use terminology that's very confusing, and a lot of people don't know what the words mean. So complete streets. And just in the past two weeks, I have been to, um, I don't know, six or seven meetings in Cheyenne, and almost every agenda has the term complete streets on it. Complete streets means that walkers, bikers, and vehicle drivers have equivalent parts of the road. Even if there's not a demand for it, you still build the road for that. This is in South Cheyenne. Plan Cheyenne mandates complete streets regardless of the impact of the people who live there. This is a nice home uh, in South Cheyenne, and a roundabout was designed to go right about where that red arrow is, about two feet from his window. <coughs> so the roundabout was more important in this man's uh, home that he had lived in for a very long time. 40 years. Complete streets in action, what does it look like? You remove driving lanes to add bike lanes. You make the, the driving lanes more narrow to add wider sidewalks. Roundabouts with truck traffic, you cannot drive a truck through a roundabout in most roundabouts now, it's prohibited. Right turns on red are prohibited because you wouldn't want to hit a pedestrian or a biker who would be waiting to cross. Uh, roundabouts are to slow vehicles so that they go the same speed as bicycles. Remove the center turn lanes to make uh, bike lanes and also to remove driveway access in front of each business and we'll go through each of those how that's going to happen. This is, um, this is another photo from I think it's east of Cheyenne, let's see, east of Cheyenne along Interstate 80. Uh, it's called a traffic calming roundabout. Now you can see this photo, there, there's not another sign of life anywhere. There's not a residential area, uh, not a lot of traffic. So step one for these roundabouts is to restrict industry and commerce. No trucks allowed here. <coughs> step two, you have to figure out why there's a roundabout, a roundabout miles from civilization. It's because it's in the plan. The transportation models for the year 20, 2040 are based on land use restrictions that are in force now. Let that sink in for a moment. Transportation models from the year 2040 are based on land use restrictions that are in place now. Why roundabouts? The, the main purpose in these documents here is to say that you can slow the cars down to the speed of bicycles, and that helps bicycle riders feel safer at intersections. Remember, I ride my bike as much as I can. I don't have anything against bike riders, but it's the concept and the mindset of Plan Cheyenne and Plan Fort Collins that is the problem. Transportation. On your bicycle? Excuse me? Do you feel safer in a roundabout on your bicycle? That is an excellent question. I will not go on my bicycle in a roundabout because it is very dangerous for walkers and for bikers. That's right. So what happens is they have to change the design, and that's already in the plans right here. They have to change the design so that they have alternate routes for bikes to go on. So they build additional ways for bikes to get around the roundabout. So transportation. The Cheyenne studies conclude this. The problem with Cheyenne's commercial areas is that there are roads that go along them that are designed for vehicles. <laughs> and you're welcome to look through any of these documents, look for the purple tabs, and you'll be able to see the proof with your own eyes. So what does that mean, mindset-wise, for, for commercial areas? The problem that these consulting firms have decided Cheyenne has is that you have roads that go to your businesses. Huh. Every driveway that leads into a business is called what, based on these consulting firms? Potential conflict. Every driveway that goes into a business. So the, the solution in the plan for every potential conflict is called access management. Access management requires that driveways into businesses be, be reduced from one for each business into a shared access. What does that do to congestion? What does it do to your business? Hurts. 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 So, speaking of potential conflict, this next photo will be coming soon to Cheyenne. It's in your plan. This is a bicycle box. Vehicles wait back here by the red arrow. Bic bicycles are allowed to cut to the front of the line. No right turns or, or on red are allowed anymore because that would put at risk. You would have to drive into the oncoming traffic to go around the bicycles to turn right on a red. What does that do to congestion? Increases. Increases it. It creates it. This is how the plan creates congestion. Access management, remember what that is, reducing access to your business, 
Livability, we'll go over that in a moment. Compact, high density design. Even though you all want wide open spaces, the plan says you need to be high, high density, compact, and complete streets. Livability, as defined in Plan Cheyenne, is the compact design, infill, walking and biking instead of driving your own personal car, using mass public transit instead of your, your private vehicle. How do you define livability? Freedom. Space, freedom, less government, less government. Yeah. private property rights. Private property yeah. rights. None of that happens to be mentioned in these thousands of pages, by the way. Just the opposite. All right, South Cheyenne. Who's familiar with Orchard Valley? Yeah. Raise your hand. I got a, I got a wonderful tour this week. Uh, thank you for the tour, by the way, of South Cheyenne, because I wanted to focus on uh, that specifically for this meeting. I fell in love with Orchard Valley. And I thought, what a cool place to raise a family. They still have dirt roads. It's a really clean, well-kept neighborhood. Uh, and I noticed there was only one home for sale on the outskirts of Orchard Valley. Everything else was lived in and, and well-maintained. So I noticed in the middle of this nice old neighborhood, there's this brand new sidewalk that twists and curves around. And I wondered, why have we added concrete in the middle of this beautiful neighborhood? The plan, the, plan so. the plan It's in the plan. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that anybody wanted a sidewalk in Orchard Valley, but it's in the plan. All right, livability and action. I'm going to take a moment to get a drink, and then we'll talk about art space. Who's art? <laughs> you want to see the space? Yeah, why does he get in space? <laughs> he rides his bike. <laughs> so, Art. Art. All right, so somebody's asking who Art is, and Art is the only person in Cheyenne and Laramie County who's going to have space once we go through. <laughs> and I, um, I was, I'll say this real quick, I, I am so honored to be here. I've gotten to know some of you over the past month. It's been a beautiful experience. I've, had a tour in, in Cheyenne. I also gave a tour in Fort Collins that proved to be quite entertaining, so it's wonderful to be here with all of you. Okay, art space. Cheyenne is being tempted by art space for infill and liv livability. Who is art space? Art space is a real estate developer who owns 35 projects across the United States. And once they come into your community, it takes them between four and seven years to complete their project. Art space funding. Who do they get their funding from? This is straight from our space. We access public funding sources. What does that mean? Tax dollars. Tax dollars. Who's, who's tax dollars? Ours. Regardless of where and how you pay taxes, they're using that money for their private real estate development. What does that do to real estate um, agents and developers who are local? Cuts them out. Makes them hold their hand out. It creates unfair competition. You guys are really smart. Art space occupants. Who gets to live in this art space building? Households earning at or below 60% of the area median income. But anyone, anyone who meets that, that income requirement can apply. The problem is that only artists are preferred in these, in these uh, communities. Is this a form of discrimination yes. on your tax money? Yes. And who decides who an artist is? Who owns art space? Once it comes to a community and uses your money, who owns that? Art space retains ownership of its projects. So taxpayer payer money is used to fund a real estate project that is owned by a private business. How does that sit with you? It won't That won't sit. All right, art space in Loveland. Loveland, Colorado actually is already in a, a contract with art space, and this is what's happened. You know Loveland, Colorado is a, is a mecca for artists, just naturally. The sculptors, I mean, it's a beautiful place to go and look at all the sculptures. In 2006, a private developer tried to buy an old building in Loveland. Uh, the Historic Preservation Council, which you have, and the Loveland City Council voted to den deny permission to this private developer to build single-family homes on that lot. So, he was blocked from buying what he wanted to to turn into single-family homes. He was blocked by the city council and the historic preservation council, which not, is not an elected body. The city of Loveland is now partnering with this private real estate art space developer to preserve the building. And the estimated project cost is $8.9 million. 
Remember, a private developer wanted to take on that responsibility, but now the taxpayers were taking it. So, will the city of Cheyenne and Laramie County elected officials get to vote on our space? Nope. They're in the they're in the negotiate the beginning process with our space right now in Cheyenne. There was an article last week in, in your Wyoming Tribune Eagle. So taxpayer money is going to fund the project. What if you don't want to fund a private developer? And who will be accountable to the taxpayers for that project? Nobody. Anybody? Nobody. Okay, here's the fun thing. If you go into a bank and ask for a business loan and tell a banker that your business plan is only financially viable, if you can access tax money from your neighbors, what will the bankers do? They may call security. <laughs> All right, safety is the new global warming. If you were here last time, we learned a lot about the uh, scientific facts behind global warming. The uh, carbon dioxide amounts in Earth's atmosphere that human beings are actually contributing is 114, 100 thousandths of 1% of the total greenhouse gases in our environment. Scientists worldwide have reported that global cooling has been occurring for decades. You all hear that in the news, right? Yeah. All right, how many people here know about the Oregon petition? Ooh, this is gonna be a fun one. The Oregon petition, 31,000 American scientists, 9,000 of those have PhDs, have signed a petition that says, limits on greenhouse gases would harm the environment, hinder the advance of science and technology, and damage the health and welfare of mankind. 31,000 American scientists have signed this petition. You can actually go online and see their beautiful signatures for yourself. All right, here's what else they say. There is no, no convincing scientific evidence that human release of CO2, methane, or other greenhouse gases is causing or will in the foreseeable future cause catastrophic heating of the Earth's atmosphere and disruption of the Earth's climate. That's right. There is substantial scientific evidence that increases in atmospheric carbon dioxide produce many ben beneficial effects. We know that, right? Yes. Yes. If you were here last time, remember we, we took a deep breath? Everybody do it together. Take a deep breath. Hold it. Keep holding it. Okay, let it out. You just reduced your carbon footprint. <laughs> and the most, uh, most extreme people who would like you to reduce your carbon footprint even more would like you to not ever breathe out again. That's <laughs> Forest fires, volcanoes, all of that um, produce massive amounts of CO2, and it, it's all dumped into the environment at one time, and we're still here. Wow. All right, so this is on the back of our, our mass transit in Fort Collins, and this little uh, billboard says, you'll use more energy on a tandem bike. There's a picture of a three-car garage with a house, a very large house, and it's saying that that house is so energy efficient that you'll actually spend more energy riding a bike than you will be living in that house. Is that true? No. no. But you feel pretty good when you read it, right? Because you're reducing your energy use? So remember what the scientific studies say about lead buildings? Science says that there is no uh, provable increase in energy efficiency or savings in lead buildings. And I say that respectively, be, respectively because we are inside a lead classified building right now. The problem is that a lot of these uh, scientific studies say that these buildings, because they cost more, <coughs> they cost more actually use more energy right. than a traditionally designed building. And that, that is heartbreaking to me because a lot of people walk in and think, wow, we're doing a good thing here. But the truth is, and the science says that's probably not the case most of the times in these lead buildings. Safety appeals to our emotions as strongly as saving the planet does. So safety is the new global warming. Think about car crashes, bicycle wrecks, obesity, heart disease, polar bears disappearing, ice melting, rising temperatures, and disappearing wildlands. That is just depressing and traumatic to think of that list. But there's a solution to everything if we would reduce our carbon emissions and be a lot safer with what we do, right? <laughs> Stop the volcanoes from going on. Let's all live in a bubble. Cap the volcanoes. All right, everyone wants safety in a healthy environment. Seriously, I do. I want that for, for everybody in this room, and for my child, and for your grandchildren, and my grandchildren. But who determines what is safe? 
Are we using science to determine that, or are we using special interest groups to determine that? Who determines what is a healthy environment? Because a lot of people are convinced that putting those CFL light bulbs in your homes and businesses is healthy. But what happens when they explode is it, it releases that toxic mercury dust into the air, and it's very difficult to get rid of. What happens to individual choice and freedom when large-scale international mandates like the UDC and external programs like Plan Cheyenne are applied to individuals? What Slave, happens? Slavery. Lose your rights. Slavery, lose your rights. How much money will be spent on educating people about how to safely ride a bike in vehicle lanes to prevent an accident? <laughs> Here's what happens in real life, and Fort Collins is the third highest ranking city in the United States for bicycle riders. And we have been educating people how to ride bikes with traffic in the traffic lanes for years. So what happens actually is that it teaches those bikers to have a false sense of security. So they don't pay as much attention as they should when they're riding alongside a semi-truck. This also leads to an increase in the accidents of bicycles. It doesn't decrease the accidents with all the safety measures and all the road planning and all the education, our bicycle accidents in Fort Collins are skyrocketing. It's tragic to see. How much money will be spent on redesigning Cheyenne's existing roadways to make bikers and walkers feel safe? Do you know how much? Too much. Nobody knows how much because the consulting firms always leave that part out. There is no cost or budgeting reference in these plans. So redesigned streets lead walkers to believe they're safer than is actually the case. Pedestrians feel safer because of the design. They're actually not safer. Public-private partnerships like art space. Here's what happens. When you start to mix government with private business, it's a natural breeding ground for corruption. It kills competition, time and money intensive. Taxpayer money is used to, to help these private businesses and that, that creates a relationship that is not there to the other businesses. It increases government control over your private business, and I'm not sure why you would want to do that unless you're using a business model that's not viable on its own. Private business owners lose their autonomy. They, have, they no longer have the right to decide what's best for their business. The private sector is beautiful. It encourages competition, creative solutions to problems, to actual problems that really exist that need to be solved. Uh, a lot more innovation. Do you know there is technology right now that we could solve our energy problems True. right now, but it's being smashed. Look at the science on that. So um, private sector, the, the creativity and the um, innovation in the private sector is beautiful. It also happens pretty quickly. You can solve problems if you don't have a lot of bureaucracy involved. This is Rocky Mountain Innosphere. It's a public-private partnership in Fort Collins, and this is going to be um, relevant to Cheyenne as well. Here's what happened. The chief financial officer for the city of Fort Collins recommended that $5 million of taxpayer money be used for this private business startup company. The chief financial officer for the city of Fort Collins sat on the board of that private business at the same time he made that recommendation to the local officials. This is called what legally? Conflict of interest. So public-private partnerships open the door to these conflicts of interest. The chief financial officer quit his job with the city and he was hired to be the director of that private business after he had recommended to the city council and they voted approving $5 million to this private business. Here's what happened. People figured it out. Wait a minute, that is a conflict of interest and he had to take a few months off before he could have started a new job. That was at the expense to everybody though. It gets worse. The city manager for the city of Fort Collins forgot to sign that contract on those millions of dollars of taxpayer money to that private business. This is an example of what happens when things like art space come to your town. The question that Beggs is asking is, if you had an artist community here that was viable, do you think it would already exist? Yep. Yes. yes, and it does. It does. Beautiful. It does because the natural market is supplying that need, right? right. You don't have to create a whole business and subsidize it with taxpayer money because what you want is already here. What the community wants is already here. So our space in Loveland and our space in Cheyenne are public-private partnerships, just like this RMI in Fort Collins. Those projects are using taxpayer money for unsustainable business models. And there is no elected official oversight of the use of that taxpayer money. How does your money flow through Plan Cheyenne? Do you know how, where your money goes? 
Is it in the budget right now? Is there money right now in your city and county budget for Plan Cheyenne? No, yes. No, yes. The Metropolitan Planning Organization applies for grants and funding programs at the state and federal level. The Metropolitan Planning Organization for Cheyenne, MPO, is basically the, the bank for these programs, <coughs> Plan Cheyenne programs. The grant money that they apply for is your local taxpayer money that has been moved up to the state and federal level. It's coming back down. So it goes all the way up, comes all the way back down. That money goes to the MPO to implement the plan. So here's what you do. Start watching your <coughs> agendas at the city council and the commissioner's meetings. There's part of your agenda called the consent agenda. That always happens at the beginning of the agenda and it's items on your agenda that are uh, supposed to be not controversial or are automatically approved and adopted by your city council commissioners and mayor. They don't pull it off to discuss it. There's no public input. So what happens with these, the money through these programs is all of that money goes onto the consent agenda because it's already in the plan. Why would you want to talk about it, right? Start watching your agendas and look at the consent portion specifically. Go to your council meeting, commissioner's meeting, and as a public person in the public, you can pull that agenda item off and require a discussion on it. Yes, ma'am. MPO, what authority is it incorporating? That's a great question. Say that. And if you if you have questions, write them down. If you won't remember them, because we will do questions at the end. Okay. That's an excellent question. What authority does the, does the MPO have, right? All right, so after Plan Cheyenne is approved, your local official's oversight and authority on taxpayer money spending is transferred to the MPO. Once this is adopted, this 500 pages and this 300 all that money gets transferred to the MPO. Is money property? Yes. yes. Money is property? Name the constitutional amendment that talks about property. Fourth. 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 Fifth. And Fifth. Fourteenth. What does that? What do those amendments say about property? It's yours. Right. It's private. You can't search it. Can't search it without a warrant. Specifically with probable cause and stating exactly what they're searching for? Yes, sir. You have to be compensated if it's taken? What, sir? Can't seize it. Can't seize it? Okay, think about art space again. They are taking your money to fund a private business. And how is that legal? No. Constitutional? No. No. Statutorily correct. Mm -hmm. Huh? Because remember the hierarchy? Yep. Hold up your constitu US Constitution again. Anything that's in this Constitution is the top law. That means that anything that's up here that is not in compliance with that is automatically illegal. That's, right. that's really hard to hear. Because look at all this work. This is just on biking and walking. <laughs> That's not on historic preservation, because historic preservation has the same amount of stuff. This is not on transportation for vehicles. This is not on roadway design. So remember that any time you come up against a statute, a rule, a code that is not in compliance with the Constitution, you have a problem. The city's going to have a problem. The commissioners are going to have a problem. This whole county is going to have a problem. That's one of the reasons I'm here. Because honesty and exposure of the evidence and the facts is what I do. And I, I'm now becoming really attached to this community <laughs> because of you. <laughs> I, I have a feeling that I would not be able to move here at this point. <laughs> Okay, what's new in Cheyenne since the town hall meeting two weeks ago? Just two weeks ago we were here. There's a lot new. Over the past two weeks there have been a lot of meetings about Plan Cheyenne. Those meetings have had federal, state, and local employees, elected officials, consultants, and hundreds of people attending for the approval of Plan Cheyenne. That's what the agendas say. Before they even vote on this, it says this is for the approval of Plan Cheyenne. Can you comprehend that mindset? What pressure does that put on the council, the commissioners, and the, the boards and commissions? We're here to approve this. We're not here to discuss it. We're not here to learn the facts about it. We're here to approve it. 
patterns have emerged. These are the good parts. The consultants say that the 2040 Plan Cheyenne transportation model is based on land use changes in this current Plan Cheyenne. You know what that means? It's confusing, isn't it? So you listen to these consultants give their updates to the county commissioners and the council. You wonder, wait a minute, it's not, it's 2014. The 2040 transportation model is based on land use changes that are in this plan that haven't even occurred yet. <laughs> All right. So what does it mean in practical terms? Radical changes to the land use produce impacts on transportation, right? Yes? Yes. The plan creates congestion problems that must be solved by human walking. Do you see how this is becoming very circular? And it's turning into a spiral? The consultants say there is no performance monitoring section for these radical changes in Cheyenne's way of life. If you apply for grant money in the private sector, do you know one of your most important parts is your budget and your performance monitoring section? There isn't one that exists for Plan Cheyenne. There's no way to monitor what's happening and there's no budget. There's no cost associated for any of this. The consultants say there are possible data sources and potential data to be collected. The MPO and Pro Plan C officials say if we don't take the money, someone else will get it. If you do take the money, what happens? Somebody else will get it. You actually give authority and jurisdiction to the federal government. Because grant money has strings attached to it. That's how it works in the private sector, too. If you say to somebody, I'm going to do this for you for $40,000, you had better do that for $40,000. And if you don't do that for $40,000, you're going to get a lawsuit. That's in the private sector. So when you take federal and state dollars for these grants, for these programs, and you don't fulfill it, what happens? I'll tell you what happens. They come after the taxpayers to make up the difference. This is the Laramie, Co Laramie County Public Works building. We were at a meeting here a couple days ago. Now this is way outside of town. Ha raise your hand if you've been here to the, the, this new beautiful building. It's a long drive, but you'll be <coughs> happy to know <coughs> that it's uphill both ways. A lot of wind going out there that day. Wyoming <laughs> 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 Department of Transportation actually were uh, warning vehicles, you know, because of the wind. You do have a wind issue in Wyoming. But in compliance with the plan for all government buildings, you have bicycle racks. Are you ready for this? Inside the Laramie County Public Works building, I could not believe my eyes. There are showers, end of ride facilities. So if you ride your bike all the way out there, you work up an aroma. <laughs> you take a shower, you don't offend your co-workers. Showers. All right. The Cheyenne MPO Technical Committee did this. This is a technical committee from the Metropolitan Planning Organization. One of the most powerful organizations in Laramie County is the MPO. They voted to adopt Plan Cheyenne prior to discussion about the plan's major changes in land use, even though the major changes to transportation are founded upon land use. Do you know that one of the um, board members actually said, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think we might have a problem here because we haven't discussed half of this yet and we're voting on it. Somebody did speak up, but it didn't matter because he was outnumbered. The other, other interesting thing about the uh, MPO Technical Committee is there is no elected official on this committee. And we were told in the meeting the reason for that is because it's a technical meeting and elected officials are technical. So, this is the beautiful part. This Cheyenne Technical Committee had some really good questions. One of them was, are the models used in Plan Cheyenne driven by landowners? I felt like standing up and cheering. Yay for that question. Is this actually based on landowners? And he also asked, this was the, the chairman, uh, Mr. Beard, is Plan Cheyenne development driven as things are actually happening in Cheyenne? Are those the best questions ever? Yep. Those are so good. Here was the answer. This is how the NPO director, Mr. Tom Mason, answered. This is his answer. The U.S. Census was used for forecasting, and the focus is on models. Who's model? Uh, hmm? All right, here's the obvious question. 
How is data from the census used for forecasting when the census data is measuring what is actually occurring at the time the information is collected? Here's a plain English answer. Plan Cheyenne wholly ignores real-time and real-world data that is specific to Cheyenne's developers and the community's desires. We have it on record in multiple meetings over the past two weeks. They are not paying attention to the community. They're basing their data and their modeling on things that don't exist. And there is no budget attached to any of it. Here's what else the MPO director said, and this gives me chills. From this point forward, landowners would have to amend the plan before they go to zoning. Landowners would have to amend this plan before they go to zoning. Do you get a chance? Do you vote for it? How do you do that? How do you amend the plan? Yeah. Who's voting on it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ignore that comment. <laughs> Just for the record. Yeah, so can you imagine as a landowner having to amend the plan, Plan Cheyenne, before you go to zoning for your business? For your home? You have to pass it to find out what's in it. <laughs> right, because they haven't read it yet. Remember, they voted without reading it or even knowing what the major updates were. Here's something else the consultants say. The only reason that the 2040, 2040 roadway project is not realistic is because Cheyenne does not have $505 million to implement it. They say that's the only reason it's not realistic. But what about the whole, the whole aspect that is modeled on 2040 on, on land use plans that are in place now? The consultants say this plan Cheyenne update has been streamlined. You heard that in every meeting for the last two weeks, streamlined. Here's what streamlined means. It means that specific actions and how they're going to implement this have been removed, streamlined. So that if you want to go and read and figure out what's actually going to happen, it's going to be very difficult for you to do that. Exception. The federal agent who was at the MPO technical committee said that MAP, 20, MAP 21 funding is performance-based requirements attached to the money. Plan Cheyenne does not have performance-based measurements available, and it's at least 18 months away before they get it. <coughs> the $114 million that is earmarked for Cheyenne's transportation project as related to Plan Cheyenne has been identified as future funding. It doesn't exist right now. Here's what's happening to MAP 21 funds. MAP 21 funds expire this year. They're trying, Congress is, Congress is trying really hard right now to uh, figure out how to make up that money, the difference in the money that's going to expire. So the $114 million might not even be available, but it doesn't matter because you don't even have performance measurements in place. It's gonna be a year and a half before you even get those. Pro plans, the officials say, plan Cheyenne is just a guide. Mm. It's simply a guide. Don't worry about it, just look the other way, go about your business. If Plan Cheyenne is just a guide, why are the mayor, city council, and county commissioners voting on it? That's right. If it's just a guide, you know, like you get a little guide with your toaster, that's a guide. It kind of tells you how to use your toaster. It's not a law. It just tells you what, you know, to do. The consultants say they tried really hard to get public participation in Plan Cheyenne, and only one person showed up when they held a public meeting on Plan Cheyenne. This is a public hearing at 3.30 in the afternoon and we had 140 people who showed up. Somehow there's a communication problem between the city county officials who are pushing Plan Cheyenne and the people. Because look around this room. A lot of people knew about this meeting and you all didn't have the power of the media behind you or government websites. But somehow you knew about it. In spite of hundreds of comments from people against the plan, Boards and commissions are recommending adoption anyway. This is called transforming local governments. Community-led decision-making is being morphed into federal jurisdiction and international mandates. It's all right in here, and right in front of you. Remember, your, your number one consultant was from Switzerland. Yeah. All right, if Plan Cheyenne is adopted by a vote of the city and county elected officials, how will this so-called guide be legally classified at that point? The guide becomes local law. It's codes, ordinances, it's local law. It's enforceable by what? Remember, what enforces Plan Cheyenne? UDC. UDC. What are the top issues that bother people most about Plan Cheyenne? And again, this is one of the benefits of, of my life, and that's talking to you and getting to know you. 
Individual choice versus force is a big thing, especially in Wyoming, come on. <laughs> Local control versus federal control is also huge. Yep. Remember how many people swore an oath to the Constitution? That means something to you. <laughs> I have had the honor of looking in veterans' eyes when they say, I swore an oath to defend this country against foreign and domestic terrorists. And I take that oath seriously. You're beautiful people here. I don't want your way of life to be changed unless you want it to be changed. That's the key. for uh, a lot of you is the lack of information from the city and county about the details of the plan. That's right. mm -hmm. It's nearly impossible, even for elected officials, to find these documents right here. It's nearly impossible to get the links to work. You have to know how to do it. That should not be the case when a plan this big is coming your way. And the final largest issue is that there's no budget for this plan. There's no cost estimate for implementing thousands of pages of plans. No guess. There's no guess. So these are just things I wonder about. Stand up if you have asked your elected officials to spend tax money on adding bicycle lanes to these existing roads in Cheyenne. Stand up if you've done that. <laughs> oh boy. Stand up if you'd like your tax money spent on repairing the existing roads in Cheyenne for vehicles. <laughs> oh, look at that. <laughs> I think that's called a majority. Yeah. We could call it a consensus. <laughs> All right. Another question. How many people in Cheyenne are demanding bike lanes and bike racks and showers in their workplaces? How many people in South Cheyenne want to walk to downtown? If you had a path to do it on, I mean. Come on. After, after you're educated, it'll work, right? Pine Bluff walking up here. Pine Bluff? Yeah, sure. You have to plan ahead, sir. Yeah. Ahead. Yes. Well, how about we send the governor and the mayor down there to walk with you? <laughs> so we got much to talk to. That is an excellent idea, but this uh, this volume three of the On Street Bicycle Plan and the uh, pedestrian plan will actually help you learn how to plan appropriately from Pine Bluffs. Uh, uh, Feel free to come up and read it. <laughs> Thank you, I'll stay on my end. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so I, I wonder why. Why? Why is there so much time and money being spent on bicycles and walking studies in Cheyenne, Wyoming? Corruption. Why? Uh, Look, how, Look outside. outside. And you know, even in the summer, it's difficult sometimes to walk standing straight up in Cheyenne. <laughs> what poultry questions? What have we learned from other communities that have implemented this plan already? And remember, it's the same as, as Fort Collins. Even though the consulting firms will say, oh no, Miss Lynn is mistaken. This is not the same as Fort Collins' plan. It's the same plan. So we've done it. We've done it already. What's happening? We get bike riders hit. We have our newspapers full every day of bicycles and pedestrians who have been creamed by cars. But we've already taught them how to do it, so why isn't it working? Too much fluoride in the water. Too much fluoride in the water. <laughs> 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 Too much fluoride could be an issue. <laughs> so what we've learned in Fort Collins is that uh, children, adults are getting hit by cars all the time. It's tragic. So the education doesn't work. Taking out driving lanes for, for walking and, and biking doesn't work. Why are we doing it? Legal marijuana. Don't even go on the marijuana issue. Come on, let's stop focusing. All right, so here are possible solutions. Now remember, these are solutions that I have heard from some of you, that I have seen in other communities that have these same plans, but your solutions are going to be unique to Cheyenne. Because Cheyenne is so different from Boulder and Fort Collins and New York and Philadelphia. So here are some ideas. Return the authority to your city and county planning departments and keep everything local. 
That warms my heart. You have good people here. How about if you let your city and county departments do what they're there for, mm -hmm. instead of taking it to all these different countries and states? City council can vote no. Yeah. They can recommend that Cheyenne be, Plan Cheyenne be placed on the ballot. They can do that on their own. It's up to them. They are your local elected officials. All right, think about this. Every time you have a constitutional or civil rights violation against you personally, because you've been injured by something in Plan Cheyenne, what is your legal recourse for that? Sue, Sue the UN. Sue the UN. <laughs> I'd love to see a lawsuit against the United Nations. That'd be fabulous. So let's say, let's be more specific here. If you have a business and you are trying to uh, add an entryway, a driveway into your business and, and you can't, even though it would increase safety and access to your business, you can't because it's not in the plan, what can you do as a business owner? Close. You can give up. A lot of people in Fort Collins have given up and they have left downtown because there's no parking, nobody can get to the stores anymore. You have an injury, you've suffered an injury that's direct and provable. You can sue them. Who has time and money to sue all the time for every violation in this? So they're going to hope you give up and you just go away. So think about the statutes that you have for Wyoming. They're below the Constitution. Everything in the Constitution has uh, authority and supremacy over your statutes. So find an attorney. Ask, ask an attorney about what's illegal and not in these plans. One of the things uh, that I've experienced because of what I do is uh, people are trying to sue me now because I'm acting like an attorney and giving legal advice. I'm not doing that. I'm saying get your own attorney and dig into it for yourself because you know what? Everybody in this room has the intelligence to figure out what's constitutional, unconstitutional, legal, and illegal. You already have that in you. All right, here's more solutions. Your county and city attorneys have the authority and the responsibility to halt Plan Cheyenne based on the unconstitutionality of it. They have that responsibility. Do you know why? County and city attorneys are responsible for protecting the government, not you, the government. So if they know this is unconstitutional and, and they let it go forward without saying, hold the phone here, this is illegal, then they have a problem. So this plan invites hundreds of individual lawsuits against the city and county because of severability. Unified Development Code says that everything in here is a separate issue. So if you have five issues in here that are violating your constitutional or civil rights, you have to sue five separate times. You can't sue based on the entire document. Severability means each item has to be sued individually. That's a lot of lawsuits. If an elected official swears under oath to honor and obey the United States Constitution, and then he or she knowingly and intentionally violates that oath, it is called what? Treason. 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 Perjury. Beautiful. Perjury is a crime. It's treason by reason by way of sedition. Treason. If you go against the Constitution, you undermine the grand law of the land. And any time you undermine that after you've taken the oath, that is sedition, which is a form of treason, which is culpable under the Title 18 U.S. statutes. In fact, specifically, the Statute 2381. Okay, now I'm going to say this one more time. This is your candidate for governor. Amen. <laughs> knows the law, and I have a feeling he'd enforce it. <laughs> We'd probably help. This is the important part. If you have something to write with, please, please do. Monday, just a couple days from now, the city governing body gets to hear this resolution being introduced to them. It's at 6 p.m. On Tuesday, March 4th, the County Board of Commissioners, are you ready for this? They get to hear the introduction and they get to vote on it at the same time. They have no time to consider this resolution. That happens at 3.30. Tuesday, March 4th at 6, as soon as you get out of the commissioners, you're going to go to the city council again. The, the committee of the whole of your city council is going to hear a, the explanation of what this Plan Cheyenne update is. On Monday, March 10th, this is the big one, your city council is going to vote on Plant Cheyenne at 6 p.m. 
These meetings will all have opportunity for public comment. It will not be like the meetings over the past two weeks where most of them we were just um, listening to what was being said. So if you have things that concern you the most, start, start making notes so that you can coherently express your concerns to your elected officials. If you want to stay updated and involved, who's doing that with the email list and contact information? Betty in the back, in the purple sweater. If you want to get updates about what's happening in the next two weeks, there's going to be a lot. It's un unbelievable what has happened in the past two weeks. So leave your contact uh, information with Betty. And I'd like just to point out Betty there for a moment. Betty, uh, we've known each other for years, even though we just met <laughs> a couple weeks ago. She, um, she actually moved from Colorado to Wyoming to escape Agenda 21 plans. Plan Cheyenne and Plan Fort Collins and Plan Glenwood and Plan Vail. She moved here to get away from it. We and, love you, uh, sis. <laughs> I, I want to specifically thank the South Cheyenne Community Development Association for making this meeting possible. They put it together really quickly, and it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for everyone. Thank you to the people of Cheyenne. Thank you. For showing me authentic Western hospitality. I truly am invested in your community and my heart. You beautiful people, thank you. And um, I'm sorry, where's Laura? Do we have time for questions? I'm not sure the time. Yes. This is a good part. Raise your hand if you have a question. Yes, sir. Let's go back to property where you were talking property. And this is as though I understand it, so you might be able to clarify for me. By your statement, it is a way of understanding we are going to live in socialism. Yeah. We're going to live in communism. Yeah. How many people in this, in this auditorium have ever been to an East Block country? Raise your hand if you've ever been to an East Block country. There's a few of us. Now, if this you, one's special for yes, us. Yes, if you've been there because of your service to this country, you raise your hand. Is that where you want to live? You want to live, in, you want to live under, the, under the law of somebody telling you what you can, can, how much you eat, how much electricity you use, how much of anything that you can have? <coughs> well, let me tell you, if y'all are going to take this, I leave it. I leave in your state because I don't want to live in so much. That's right. And here's, here's the interesting thing. You mentioned people watching what you eat and telling you what you can and cannot eat, and I appreciate the passion, sir. In this, um, in this document here, this pedestrian plan, guess what it says? You know, if, you, if you're a little bit overweight or you enjoy eating, you don't like exercising so much, this plan is going to tell your local officials how to encourage you to eat less and walk more. It's offensive to me because it's a violation of who you are as an individual. But they, they present this as if it's going to save humanity. It's actually doing the opposite. Because it's stripping us of who we are as individuals and that the individual energy that we have in this room is the most powerful and beautiful thing there is. Question? Yes, sir. We, uh, we talked about this at the county commissioners <coughs> For those that you have heard, you asked the question, why? I can tell you why. You said it right up there, underwriting grants. Right. We have self-imposed government agencies. We already have one. We have one downtown. It's called the DDA. They get, and we have a mayor, we have a council person here. I don't know what their budget is, but I know it's close to a million dollars, about $800,000 plus. They write grants among themselves, and they <coughs> share it among themselves. Find out who's in who's ahead of these grants and what they're writing them for, and we better cut it off at the head. Yeah. Because I'll tell you what, we get nothing done downtown. I own a business downtown. So for the last 20 years, they've been getting close to a million dollars a year. Where are our improvements downtown? They don't exist. They take this money and they utilize it among themselves and they hide behind these nonprofit association groups. That's where they're at. The, the interesting thing, remember I was talking yeah. about how these types of things breed corruption. And when you start to follow the money trail, it gets a little bit disturbing because then you start realizing who's really involved in all of this. Um, one of the issues is the, D, the Downtown Development Authority 
is in a partnership with the city. And so we already have an inherent conflict of interest. And if, unfortunately, you'll be able to see what happens as our space moves more closer to becoming a reality here, who's actually going to benefit most from that? Other no, questions? Yes, ma'am. Someone earlier asked, where does the authority come from, from the NPO? Well, oh, that's a good question. Where does the NPO get its authority? Who knows? Document, they don't have it. From the city. No. From the city? Are they, who, who is Mr. Tom Mason accountable to? No. He's the director of the NPO. He has all this money that he asks for and receives. No one. He's not an elected official. He can't be removed. It's, it's a position that's been created to be pretty secure, to be pretty uh, protected. Yes, Mayor, you can answer that. May I? I will try to answer. The NPO, uh, metropolitan organizations across the United States, and again, I'm going to try to stay away from the federal government, okay? NPO plans are created for planning for metropolitan areas. History will show, to show us that the MPOs were approved in Wyoming by the state government. But please keep in mind, dollars come from the federal government to the state government, trickles down, just like our tax dollars go the opposite way. So the state of Wyoming did approve the MPOs. There's two MPOs in the state of Wyoming, one in Casper, one in Cheyenne. There is a partnership between Wyoming Department of Transportation, Laramie County, and the city of Wyoming what is referred to as the MPO Policy Committee. And that is kind of, if I may, the oversight entity that works with the MPO. Those are the three partners, and much of the information that was shared this afternoon does address much of the work that the MPO Policy does, mostly with transportation, if I may. So those are the, their, that location, or that uh, quasi-agency, if I may, works and monitors some of the grants, and some of the requirements, and looking at Plan Cheyenne as well, because they're all parts of that. So, again, there's a dotted line from an organizational structure, if I may, of all those three uh, government entities that helps uh, monitor, work with, and oversee the MPO. The direct, the direct question is this: Who who hires and fires Mr. Mason? Uh, the uh, there is not a definitive answer to that. I want to okay? There's a direct line. The city of Cheyenne is the fiscal agent, so when we look for grants and everything else, that comes to the governing body for action on that, whether it's going to be approved or not approved, and that's where it's going to be. I, I, don't know. I don't know. Maybe I can be a little more specific here. Who hired Mr. Mason? Uh, I was not at, uh, in the city of Cheyenne at that particular time. He's been there for, I think, 20 plus years, so I do not know who made the authority. I've asked for that information because one of the uh, individuals in this room sent me an email on Friday inquiring very similar types of things. And who has the power to dismiss So this, this isn't, yes sir. Mr. Mayor, on the votes, if the county commissioners vote for it and the city council votes against it, who supersedes who? Because it's, again, in my, my understanding, it has to be kind of a, uh, an all or nothing. All or nothing. I'm, I'm sorry, what, what was your question again? In the event when it comes up for votes, for the vote for the MPO to continue, on this one, is it? Uh, Clinch. Well, you just put the next next week. Yes. When the city council, the whole body, is going to vote on it. Yes. But if they vote against it and the county commissioners vote for it, who supersedes who or who? That, that's an excellent question. So you would have to have the city attorney answer this legally, and I can tell you what the documents say. This plan, Cheyenne, is for the city of Cheyenne, but the, the MPO has included the county. Yes. Okay? So when the city votes on this, what, what happens? What, the, county? The, the, the county cannot um, nullify their vote. And this is one of the legal issues that's going to come up. Let's say the county says no to it. City says yes, but the boundaries for Plan Cheyenne cover a lot of the county. We already have a major legal issue on our hands because who's going to enforce? That reminds me of another thing: the boundaries and the zones and the specific maps that are in this update are not accurate, and that was brought up at the technical committee as well. So when they vote on it, are the are the maps going to be accurate or not? No. 
there is a lot of legal issues surrounding these documents. So, yes, Mayor. I would like to offer one other thing, if I may. Uh, so your time is not wasted in the future. And I do apologize. I have to leave because I have a 530 commitment and I have to go and prepare for that. I wanted to uh, listen to more of the public's concerns and what happened. I apologize if I cannot get that. But there was a date up there where in this, this coming Monday night, February the 24th, that I did identify that the uh, plan of Cheyenne will be introduced to the uh, governing body of the city of Cheyenne. The process is for introduction. No discussion has taken place that evening. It is only an introduction, and again, no public comment is taken. So I did not want you to expect me to show up and ready to chat about it, and what we do. That then is when the committee as a whole will gather on uh, March the 4th, and that's where you will be able to provide the public input. So again, uh, please, uh, that's only for introduction purposes. And sir, can you hold on just one minute before you leave? Sure. The, the key about February 24th is I want you to be there anyway. Everybody wants yeah, you yeah, to be yeah, there yeah. anyway so that you can listen. Even though you can't speak, what holds elected officials accountable is to see people listening to what the resolution is. You need to know what the resolution says because it's probably loaded with legal issues just in the resolution. And do you have a question for the mayor, sir? Yeah. Yes, please do. Uh, thank you, with all due respect, uh, I'd like to know your opinion. I've talked to contractors, home inspectors, landowners. Uh, a lot of people know this even before this at all. I mean, the opposition is overwhelming. My question is, do you have any idea why I'd like to about continuing to push this rather than looking at uh, listening to the people out there and want to you know, that's, that's, a good discussion. Yeah. that's a fair question. I will say that there are other people that uh, your general statement about nobody supports it is incorrect. We have had a lot of folks right up there on that table say, we want more ability to travel throughout our community, not only by vehicle, but by bicycle, by, by walking, by strolling, by whatever they do. That's baloney and you know it. So let's, let's show respect regardless of the opinions, so the please. Question, the question is, and I think this was addressed in, uh, earlier in the presentation and some of the discussion, the MPO, prepares plans. If there is a plan that has been approved, then we go forward and try to secure the funding. So as was identified earlier, grant dollars come in to make many of the projects that we uh, are able to uh, move this uh, facility or this uh, community forward. When I say community, I mean the entire area, just not the city of China. So as I identified earlier, this is a grant written or driven in a manner of speaking uh, process to try to secure funds because we know that in Wyoming we do not have the funds to do it. The city of Cheyenne, Laramie yeah. County, cannot raise funds on their own to do this. So we do look for the grant uh, process. And Mr. Mayor, I want to get one more because this is this man is your one of your constituents. I want to allow him to ask you a question, then I would like to address you before you leave, sir. That's an excellent question. Uh, I filed the open records request personally with Mr. Mason on Thursday. Uh, I hand delivered it to him. He has been wonderful. He has been uh, emailing me back and forth for the last two days. He will re he will fulfill that request. Is uh, way we can see the results of your inquiry? Yes, I will I will publish that in some format so everyone can see that. Uh, and I have a feeling we're going to have another meeting. <laughs> By the 24th, Wyoming law, ha actually, uh, that's an excellent question. Wyoming law allows them 10 days. But because Plan Cheyenne kind of snuck up on everybody because there wasn't so much um, advertising about it, it'd be great if we could get that expedited. So um, Mr. Mason and I have been communicating. He's working on it. I'm not sure how long it will take him. Having it before the 24th is an excellent, well, that's Monday. So um, if we could have it Monday morning via email, that's how I've requested the information, that'd be great. I also want to say, even though there's a lot of uh, disagreement with people who are supporting Plan Cheyenne, you all are at an advantage because you have elected officials in this room who are here yep. to learn yep. what you want yep. and, and what the facts are. So I want to say thank you, Mayor, for taking time out of your side. I would also, I would also 
like to thank uh, Councillor Williams. She has been digging into this, doing as much reading as she can on her own time, trying to learn about the plan and to learn what the people want. So thank you, Councillor Williams. Uh, and also, I want to recognize Commissioner, also, for his time. Okay, let the mayor address one thing. There was a question right here. Uh, it wasn't spoken, but I think I'm uh, not reading your mind, by the way. Okay, but where, is, where are the meetings for uh, the City of Cheyenne activity? Uh, traditionally held in our City Council Chambers and our Municipal Building at 2101 O'Neill Avenue. Okay, looking at the interest of this, I've made written myself a note to see if we can move this to a larger location. So we can comfortably uh, have everybody there, not standing in the aisles or anything like that. So uh, if it does change, we will get the notice out on February the 24th again next Monday. This coming Monday night, again, uh, you're, you're more than welcome. Uh, but it's an introduction only. It's uh, part of the consent agenda because there's no action taken on it. So it'll be introduced through the consent agenda and your presence will say we're interested and that's about it, okay? I don't, I don't mean to say we're cutting you off or anything like that. It's just the way that uh, that has been created for the city of Cheyenne for many years. If we do um, move the committee of the whole May meeting as well, which is again is on March the 4th, and if we move the meeting for March the 10th, which is identified as the date for the council to take action, we will get notice out as far as that, where that will be. And I'm going to respond to something you said, Mayor, and I want to give you an opportunity to hear that, so if you need to rebut it, I'm just going to be um, honest about what you said, about how you have a lot of people contacting you about adding bike lanes and, and walking. So I want you to hear that if you'd like to, so that if you want to rebut, you have an opportunity. So the Mayor was saying that a lot of people in Cheyenne have contacted him, saying we need bike lanes, we need walking areas, we need to add all of this. And the consultants, um, in their own study results, say that 45 people in the community participated in the process. But that doesn't mean those 45 people wanted bike lanes and walking. <coughs> the, the consulting firms are pretty accurate about the participation. So if there's a lot of people asking for bike lanes and walking, we need to know who they are. <coughs> we need to know what, who, who they're tied to um, financially. We need to know who's pushing this uh, biking and walking. That is a key for us to know. Again, you use the term that we have to have these plans. They've asked us to consider these, thus the study. And then trying to get some information to be able to see if it's reasonable or not. <laughs> this, this entity in this group says it's not reasonable. That's what we need to hear. Mm -hmm. the other, there are other folks that say it is reasonable, so that's what we have to weigh in. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, ma'am. Right. Would, would it be helpful if um, there was a petition that said, please support the details are known and the parties who want these changes are known and the people um, in this county and, and affected areas um, are known that would a petition like that help stop this push this fast track for this plan i, I cannot give you a definitive yes or no but we could but we you, could. you have to have the right to uh, present that kind of information yes sir in the blue thank you uh, Mayor Kaysen, um, you talked about walking opportunities and biking opportunities. Correct me if I'm wrong, isn't that what the Greenway's for? <laughs> right. I mean, how much money was spent on that project? I mean, how was that utilization? I'd like to have some information on that. It's very brief. We have roughly 37 plus miles of the Greenway built over a 20 year period of time. Those dot that have been built in a couple of fashion grants that we received and also the voters that have approved six penny funding for capital improvements, and voters are learning now. It is utilized highly for walkers, bikers, runners, and this is the pedal bikers, uh, uh, strollers, uh, joggers, and anything else. So it is used to very heavily. It's not in your study, study. it's used by 10% of our population, but it is very popular. And the purpose of the Greenway is to interconnect our neighborhoods for them to be have an, uh, an option of traveling to another location. Granted, some people love to ride 20 miles on a bike. I get on a bike and I get to the end of the driveway, I think I've had a pretty good day. <laughs> <laughs> some people do that, all right? It also connects, like I say, neighborhoods to some 
businesses in the neighborhood, immediate neighborhood, or even uh, go across town to some uh, areas with parks and recreational uh, connections as well. Sir, in the back. This community has got uh, a fairly large number of retired people, of disabled vets, of retired vets. I don't think there's that many people that really need a bike trail or walking trails. We don't walk much. That's, that's what elected officials need to hear. Okay? Voice to hear. You have the opportunity to share same with both county commissioners and the uh, governing body. Thank you, Mayor. Are there any other questions? Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Maybe two or three. Let's, let's do two more. Let's do this gentleman here in the vest and then this woman over here. Thank you. Um, bike paths and um, walking paths are great for recreation. What happens if you have to go to work, bring four or five bags of groceries home to your house? How is that going to work out? They haven't figured that, poor, that part of thing on. Besides the, the weather, they haven't talked about that. In the plan, they talk about a square mile separate like a small community and they're going to have their own parks they're going to have their own stores what's going to happen with our larger stores that bring lower prices these small stores are going to have higher prices just because they have less commodities less that they can buy and so forth and how is that going to interwind with the present community there's they're so vague i think that's what happened with the roundabout that was being proposed on um, Fox Farm Road. It was cloaked in the interpretation. You know, with the vagueness of it, you can interpret it any way today. Six weeks from now, it can be interpreted some other way, and it all flies because it's not specific. But getting to work, getting to school, getting your groceries home. Would you like the mayor to address that? Yes, I would, thank you. It's different from recreation. And taking a stroll. <laughs> I don't have a, an answer. I don't know. You know, I can say it's an individual choice how you're going to get your groceries home or something like that, or how you may get to school, or how you may get to work. Uh, that's not a that's not a great answer. They don't want us to drive. So I'm just trying to answer some questions. I'm not going to sit here and support or not support my No, so we. We said that you would take two questions and you're done. If you need to go, that way. that's fine, Mayor. If you want to take a couple more, it's up to you. Yeah. One more. Please. One more question. This woman here had her hand up. Mayor, can you tell us the best way to get you to postpone this? I mean, what would it take for you to postpone on this? I I am not the the sole vote postpone, approve, or reject. It is a decision by the full city council and myself. So how do we go about this? You the education to, if you would like to uh, say, uh, I can answer first. There's some unanswered questions as, as Stacy has presented this afternoon. If you believe that there are enough, uh, there's not enough information or anything like that, even though there's been a lot of activity, a lot of discussion, you're not satisfied, you can work through a council person who then makes a motion to postpone that postponement is, is discussed by the public, whether it's a good thing or not a good thing, and then it's also discussed by the council, and then we take a vote on it. That would have to be a decision Mrs. Williams. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I was going to say, if you do approach Councilor Williams, please do, please do it not in a mob so that she uh, can hear everybody's opinions. 
And also, I wanted to say thank you again for coming. I know you have to, to hit the road, so thank you. Thank you. The council, Councilor Williams would like to say something. Well, I have no respect for the mayor. I would suggest is that if you have any question about it, Okay. Well, thank you for 
Thank you for showing up. Oh, yes, yes, the SCCDA. I've been to your meetings. I will continue to go whatever I can do to support. I think you have a good base right here. You know what? We need to hear our voices. Uh, so I, I would like to um, just redirect a little bit. Uh, if anybody else has a, a question for the counselor, though, please raise your hand for, the, for Councilor Williams. Thank you. Why do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to, you know, just to, um, I'm still also being educated on the trench I am. It is a very thick book. I spent my four day weekend trying to read, you know, what's in the plan. So I can myself ask questions regarding what it is about. Because I need to educate myself on it. I've been in the council a, well, a year now, and therefore there's a lot of things that I'm still learning about the process and, and how the council works. Uh, with that being said, you know, a lot of the decisions that I'm making are not personal decisions. The community, you know, I'm trying to reach out to the community for your help. And that, you know, to get that kind of a help, um, support, um, to show up, even if I don't like the way I voted or the way I voted. Um, so whatever question you have for me, I just have to answer to you for you. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have a question on your diligence in trying to absorb the material in French on end. I know you probably can't answer this question, but you surely have some idea. How many of the other members of city council do you think would go to that effort to find out what's contained in that plan? Okay. <laughs> I don't know if I answered that. I am hoping that um, they will look at
So we're going to just do a couple more questions, and I'm going to wrap up my part. So this man, right? If we can, oh, I'm sorry, Councilor. Okay. having a governor, governor appoint a local official is it's part of the Wyoming Joint Powers Act, and we don't have this in Colorado, so it's something I'm learning about, but the Wyoming Joint Powers Act gives authority to people who aren't elected officials who are appointed. The tricky thing is that if you have a problem locally with that official who's been appointed, how do you get him removed? Well, you have to go through the governor, so that is a, a pretty cumbersome pro process. Sir. Bring him up. I expressed my opinion uh, a year ago when the city adopted the uh, UDC code. Sean Allen, Jim Brown, Mark Ray, and I believe one or two other individuals that sit on our dais in the chamber, they voted for it even though there were many of us that expressed our opinion to uh, vote no, it was bad for the community. Anyway, they thought better than us. And I went online and I read quite a bit and I had a hard time understanding some of it, but can you possibly expound just a short statement or two on the brownfield aspects that are involved in the uh, so-called codes? That's an excellent question. Here's what the brownfield, he's asking about brownfields. The, the Metropolitan Planning Committee, it's the technical committee, uh, asked that question of Mr. Mason. The biggest concern for Mr. Frank Cole, do you all know Mr. Cole? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He owns the land uh, around the mall, I'm learning. His question was, why isn't stormwater addressed in this entire document? Stormwater has to do with brownfields. So we're missing an entire segment of planning, community planning. It's not in the codes and it's not in the plan. So the question is why? Why are we passing a document that is leaving out one of the main infrastructure requirements of the community? I'm looking into that right now, so I appreciate the question. I don't have the answer yet, but I'm going to get one. It's a, it's a major concern. How can you pass a major community plan that's looking all the way out until 2040 without talking about stormwater? Excellent question. Yes, ma'am. So, my son has written several articles on the Brownfield Project. You can go to the Wyoming Policy Institute and look them up. Um, he's got four articles there that are short, but they're to the point and they're easy to understand, and it might answer a lot of questions. Very nice, thank you. Could you repeat that again? Uh, yes, it's the Wyoming Policy Institute, and uh, Lars Walden is his name, and he's done, right now he'd be here, but he's in Africa, so in our country. So, um, mm -hmm. thank he you. has read very much of it, a lot of research on it. He's been all the ground field meetings that were held all around the state and everything. Thank you, and I, I still am going to answer, find the answer to why stormwater is not addressed in here. It's, it's a key legal issue. Yes, ma'am. I not totally address the stormwater issue, but I know that we have had probably a short of a year of um, disruption in the East Ridge area because of directing stormwater and we took part of the um, VA property and directed it there and um, then there's a whole farm uh, it's gone through our neighborhoods we have bigger storm drain things um, it has been addressed and as far as the and now, I'm not here representing this relation at all, but as far as that goes, um, I think that Mr. Mason has tried to address those issues. He has done an excellent job, I think, I think, before
where I heard anything about any of this. I thought he had done an excellent job on the um, Lake Street Viaduct, the viaduct that goes from um, north of there to South Cheyenne. And you know what that I, I hate that bridge. It's, it's a dangerous part of the river. I would say, I would say it'd be probably be best not to get into a <laughs> discourse amongst the audience right now. You can do that afterwards, but I, I want to answer one more question and then I'll uh, finish. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. You're just a real blessing to me personally, and I know to our community. And I from the um, Highway Administration, so the Federal Highway Transportation Authority, and they, because they were part of the MPO and because of the road system in Cheyenne, they have to be involved in those decisions when it's federal roads. And what was your first question? I'm sorry. Oh, the names? Okay, so the open records request I filed with Mr. Mason will give us the um, specific amounts that these consulting firms have been paid and what the agreements are as far as the terms of their service. What do they have to do for the amount of money that they have received? And I've requested it on only eight of um, multiple uh, organizations. Another thing that Mr. The, the mayor said that was a little bit, I hesitate to say this because he's not here to defend himself, but it was a little bit um, misleading and that may be because he does not know. I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt. For him to say that a lot of the community in Cheyenne wants bike lanes and walking paths is not accurate because the consultants have to track that. They're, they're tracking who comes to these meetings and what they want. And so for him to say that a large portion of the Cheyenne community wants it, he may be, be told that by the consulting firms and that's their job is to tell them, oh yes, your whole community wants this. It's not accurate. And that it's unfortunate because a lot of the elected officials are give, being given the same misleading information that you're all being given. And that's why I have mercy for them, because I know throughout my experience over six years, a lot of times they truly do not know what is in these documents. Yes? When my son went to all of these meetings, that he had to do the ground field and everything, they used in those meetings, I didn't know about it, it was an education for me, but it's called the Delphi technique. Are you familiar with that? Yes, and that, we talked about that at our first uh, our first town hall on February 8th, where they, it's also called a consensus, uh, it's part of the, the Delphi technique is using consensus, and I'll give you a quick example. So this half of the room is, they've all decided they want to go to choose a restaurant. Where do you want to go to, to eat dinner? Albany. <laughs> uh, well, I only heard Perkins, so we're all going to Perkins. <laughs> It's not true, is it? No. Plus, half of you didn't even say where you wanted to go. Because you may be afraid of speaking in public, you may not know where you want to go yet, you may not even want to go. But all of those considerations are not included in these meetings that come to these conclusions. Well, it's disinformation. It's disinformation, it's, it's a consensus building. And remember the term from two weeks ago? Who remembers what the consulting firms actually call that when they twist what you say into what they want to have as a result. Remember? Yes, sir. Uh, I didn't get the answer here. I, don't, I think that the city should act on this plan before the county reversed on it. Right. And that's, that's not accidental because they want, they want to go to the city at 6 p.m. and say, see, the commissioner's passed it. It's the way they, they build their uh, consensus. <clears throat> So uh, the point, the, the, the word that consulting firms use to twist what you say into what they want is called synthesizing. It's synthesizing. Think about doing that with music, what that does. It blends everything. So it's synthesizing. Okay, last question right here. I have a question because I was at some of those 2006 meetings. And my question is, only those meetings and the people involved in that, is that what they're basing this whole thing on? Yes, ma'am. That was supposedly 45 people. I can show you my picture in one of those things. I found it on the 
we didn't go in and understand that. That was not what we were told. No, that, that's right. They hear the questions just like I did. How many of you want to go to Perkins? Everybody does. Well, wait a minute. We were shown boards with pictures on it. And which one do you like? <laughs> and to evaluate different ideas. And I know that I don't think, I know three of us that it's actually for years. We didn't say we wanted to bike past through the whole city and go to shine on a bike. <laughs> synthesizing. So I, I'm going to end with that. End with that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again. <laughs> I love you all. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I've ridden a bike since I was a kid, and I don't need special bike paths, you know what I mean?